Hello and welcome to the HistoryNetwork.org podcast. Thanks to all of you who have become patrons of the podcast via patreon.com. And if you'd like to add your name to the list, we would very much appreciate it. That is patreon.com forward slash the history network. And it really does make a difference when you become a patron, as Kyle Beach did. Thanks again, Kyle, for that lovely message. And here we go with season 35. The History Network.org podcast, season 35. Episode 1, William Johnston, part 1. This episode was written by Murray Darm. Murray is an ancient and medieval military historian from New Zealand living in Australia. He has written more than 100 articles on various aspects of ancient and medieval military history as well as other historical topics from all periods ranging from the history of opera to the runic alphabet and recipients of the Victoria Cross. He is the author of Macedonian Phalangite versus Persian Warrior, Athenian Hoplite versus Spartan Hoplite, and Leuctra 371 BC, all from Osprey Publishing. He is a regular on the Ancient Warfare podcast. During the Baltic campaign of the Crimean War in August 1854, Lieutenant John Bythesea, together with Stoker William Johnston of Her Majesty's ship HMS Arrogant, performed an audacious act of bravery. This would lead to both men being awarded the Victoria Cross, among the first gazetted and earliest actions so awarded. Despite this, tragedy would soon envelop Stoker Johnston, and his story deserves to be better known. The actions of Bythesea and Johnston took place on the island of Vardo, in the Arland Islands off the southwestern coast of Finland. The Arland Islands commanded the entry to the Gulf of Bothnia, and are situated only a hundred miles from Stockholm and so controlled access to that important port. These islands had become Russian possessions in 1809, and the Russians had begun fortifying them in 1832, especially with the great semicircular fortress of Bamasund, designed to hold 5,000 men and 500 cannon, built on the main island of Fasta, Arland. It had three sixty feet tall freestanding towers built of red granite. The initial design called for six towers, and although the foundations of the other three were laid, they were not defensible in 1854. The fortress, although still incomplete in 1854, remained a bastion of Russian strength and was awkward to attack. The completed towers had bomb-proof roofs and were essentially unapproachable from the seaward side. Each tower housed 24 guns facing the sea, and so a landward assault, it was anticipated, would have more success, and it is in the planning for the land assault by 10,000 men under French command on them in August 1854 that Bythesea and Johnston's action took place. The build-up of Russian forces on the Arland Islands caused concern in both Sweden and Britain for national and commercial interests respectively. With the outbreak of the Crimean War in late March 1854, the Baltic was an important, if now forgotten, theatre in the war because of the proximity of the theatre of operations to the Russian capital, St. Petersburg. The British Foreign Secretary, Lord Clarendon, declared that one blow in the Baltic was worth two in the Black Sea. The Baltic Sea Fleet was initially put under the command of Admiral Charles Napier, and in April 1854, the fleet entered the Baltic to attack the Russian naval base of Kronstadt. The French vessels, which joined the British in June, were commanded by Alexandre Ferdinand Perceval de Chêne, 
This first assault on Kronstadt proved unsuccessful. Another attempt would be made in August, but the Russian Baltic fleet of 27 vessels was outnumbered by the Allies and so remained in port for the duration of the war. Thereafter, the Russians confined themselves to operations around their Baltic fortifications. Several of these forts, such as Zweiborg, outside Helsingfors, Helsinki, were considered too strong to assault, and so the Anglo-British force confined themselves to blockading Russian trade in the Gulf of Finland. Russia relied heavily on imports, and so this blockade did a great deal to weaken the Russian position, both militarily and domestically, forcing her to rely on more expensive overland imports from Prussia, the alliance between Prussia and Britain, following Princess Victoria's marriage to Crown Prince Frederick in 1858, was still some years off. Prussia remained one of Russia's few allies in Europe. Some of the Baltic forts were successfully attacked by the Anglo-British fleet, however, including Hogland and several lesser fortifications on the Finnish coast. After the Napoleonic Wars, the Royal Navy was radically downsized, and it now contained only officers and ships. Crews were recruited only on an as-needed basis, and there was no tradition of continuous service in Her Majesty's Navy. Usually, crew were enlisted, or press-ganged, for a specific campaign and then paid off in a lump sum at the end of their commission. If they were required again, they enlisted again, and any promotions that they may have gained on their previous commission were forfeited. Although press gangs had been abolished by the 1850s, the idea of continuous service within the Navy had only been introduced just prior to the outbreak of the Crimean War. In February 1854, when war was inevitable, but prior to the actual declaration of war by Britain against Russia in late March, Admiral Napier was given command of the Baltic fleet, initially consisting of 20 vessels and destined, in combination with the French fleet, to be the largest fleet since the Napoleonic Wars 40 years and more earlier. The British feared that the Russian fleet would escape into the North Sea, and so instructions were issued to Admiral Napier several weeks before the declaration of war that he should proceed into the Baltic and so prevent the Russian fleet from escaping. At the same time, Napier was hampered by several factors. Recruitment of enough experienced seamen to man his Baltic fleet had been a problem, and the fleet actually departed from Spithead undermanned despite the lowering of recruitment standards. Napier's request that a bounty for enlistment be offered was refused. Eventually, Napier was able to recruit foreign nationals into Her Majesty's Navy in Stockholm, and by June the British fleet was 49 vessels strong. Even though Sweden, Norway and Denmark remained neutral throughout 1854, through a fear of Russian plans and dispositions, they offered cooperation enough to the Allied fleet. Napier's command of the Baltic fleet came to an end in December 1854, and by that time the media had expressed its disdain for the apparent lack of achievement during the campaign. In response to this intense negative media, the Admiralty had made demands of Napier which he refused to sanction. These included assaults on Zweiborg and Kronstadt, which Napier correctly assessed were impregnable. When the attempt was made in 1855, under Napier's successor, Admiral Dundas's command, the assaults did indeed prove entirely ineffective. Napier had, however, left his successors a more populous, experienced, disciplined and well-trained navy. Despite the perceived lack of progress in the campaign, brave actions were undertaken. The preparations for the second assault on Bomosund in early August 1854 provides us with a clear example. On August 7th, 1854, Lieutenant Bythesea's commander, Captain Yelverton, visited Admiral Napier to discuss that an aide-de-camp of the Tsar was known to be dropping off dispatches for Bomasund 
on Vardo and that it would be useful to intercept them. Tasked by his captain, Bysi asked around the crew of the Arrogant for someone who spoke Swedish and was told that one of the stokers spoke the language. The man was leading stoker John Johnston, a man who had probably enlisted at Stockholm during Admiral Napier's efforts to bring his ship's crews up to strength. Bythesy asked Captain Yelverton for permission to land with Johnston on Vardo. Yelverton thought a bigger party might be more appropriate, but was convinced by Bythesy that just two men would attract much less attention. The 48-gun steam frigate HMS Arrogant launched in 1848 and had a crew of 450 men. Three of her crew were awarded the Victoria Cross for actions during the Baltic campaign of the Crimean War and her captain was made a Companion of the Order of the Bath. Lieutenant Bythesea and Stoker Johnston landed on Vardo on August 9th in order to intercept the messages sent by the Russian Tsar to Bomasund via Vardo, although the citation for their Victoria Cross in the London Gazette claims that the pair were well armed, it seems from other sources that they only had a single flint pistol between them, carried by by the sea. The two men landed in a ship's boat on a remote part of the island and were fortunate to locate a farmstead where the owner had a grievance against the Russians. They had requisitioned his horses to their cause. There the pair were informed of recent repairs to a stretch of road along which, they surmised, dispatches would travel. Dressing as local peasants with clothing provided by the farmer's family, they avoided a Russian search party. The two hid on the roadside on August the 12th, and when the military escort for the aid turned back, and leaving only the five couriers, Bythesy and Johnston made their move, and confronted the Russians, outnumbered five to two. Two couriers dropped their mailbags and ran, the remaining three surrendered, probably thinking that the two men confronting them were part of a larger force. Johnston tied the three Russians up with rope, while Bythesy covered them with the pistol. The two men and their three prisoners then made their way back to the remote bay where they had stowed their boat. Along the way, they avoided a Russian patrol already out looking for the missing couriers, probably informed by the two couriers who ran. Once at the boat, Bythesy and Johnston compelled the prisoners to row them back to the arrogant. Once back aboard, the captured mail was delivered to General Louis Achille Baragoy Dillière, the French commander of the expeditionary force intended to assault Bomersund, and who approved most heartily of their actions. The dispatches recovered may have contained important information since the planned assault on Bomersund seems to have been affected by them. A fleet of 25 ships was in position to surround and blockade the fortress, even though its seaward-facing defences were considered unassailable. A British and French assault force was landed on August the 8th, while Bythesy and Johnston's mission was under way, and immediately set up gun batteries facing two of the freestanding towers. The gun batteries did not open fire, however, until the morning of August 13th, the day following Bythesy and Johnston's capture of the dispatches. Narratives of the assault on Bomersund do not focus on the possible contents of the dispatches, however, but we can well imagine that they contain details on the strength and dispositions of the troops within the fort, for the fort only contained a garrison of 2,000 men far lower than expected and less than half of its capacity. If the dispatches contained information which suggested this, the fact that the assault went in so soon after their capture is explained. The initial assault by the French focused on the Tower of Branklint. The assault was successful and the defenders retired to the main fort, the tower falling to the French the same day. It was then blown up by Russian artillery fire from the main fort to deny the attackers a stronghold on August 15th. 
The second tower, Nordvik, fell to the British on the 15th and then the British and French concentrated their artillery fire on the main fort without initiating an infantry assault, which the Russians were expecting. The land-based artillery positions were supported by a naval bombardment no longer hindered by the threat of the two towers. When the Russian commander realised that the British and French intended to reduce the fort by artillery fire alone, and that he had no hope of escape or relief, he surrendered on August 16th. Despite the smaller than expected garrison, the British and French commanders were surprised by the early surrender. Engineers then demolished the fort, ensuring that it could not be rebuilt. The Treaty of Paris, concluded at the end of the war in 1856, declared that the Ireland Islands should be demilitarised, which they were, a status which has continued to this day. The combined bravery of Johnston and Bythesea resulted in both men being awarded the Victoria Cross, theirs being among the very first gazetted and awarded in June 1857. The entry in the London Gazette detailed their exploit, although it named Johnston as William and gave his rank of Stoker and claimed the two men were heavily armed. Despite the public perception, the importance of the Baltic campaign is reflected in the fact that the first three Victoria Crosses were awarded for actions during it, and there would be several more in the course of the war. The Victoria Cross itself came into being because of the Crimean War, when the actions of ordinary soldiers and sailors were noted and reported in the newspapers of the day. Discussions for a suitable medal open to all enlisted men were held in 1856 and a warrant was issued in early 1857. Recipients began to be gazetted in the London Gazette from February 1857 and the inaugural investiture was held in Hyde Park on June 26, 1857. This included several Baltic campaign recipients, including the first Victoria Crosses awarded to Midshipman Charles Davis Lucas for actions during the first attack on Bonasund on June 21, 1854, Stoker Johnson and now Commander John Bythesey, actually the second man to be physically awarded the medal. Lieutenant John Bythesey was immediately promoted after his action in August and had been promoted again and made a commander in May 1856, the rank at which he received his Victoria Cross. Although only one source calls Johnston a leading stoker, therefore a higher rank than stoker, that was the arrogance muster list and so might be considered a superior source to the London Gazette entry. The 1857 Gazette entries make several other errors, such as calling gunner John Roberts, Roberts and Hugh Talbot Burgoyne is called John his famous father's and grandfather's first name. By 1857, Johnston was a cook aboard the HMS Brunswick. This was technically a promotion, although the position of cook was of civilian status. And yet, the London Gazette listed the rank of the recipients of the Victoria Cross as they stood when gazetted, and so even though it was commander by the sea in February 1857, William Johnston was still only listed as a stoker, and certainly not a leading stoker, or indeed a cook. There is even the possibility he had been demoted by that point. Another oddity with Johnston's award is that he was invested as William Johnston, and yet there was no one of that name listed in the ship's crew list at the time. There was, however, a leading stoker John Johnston, who was listed as born in Hanover in Germany, serving on the ship at that time, he is the only candidate for William Johnston, and details of John Johnston's biography are combined with the Victoria Cross recipient. There were at least two other William Johnstonses serving in the British Navy at the time, but neither is a candidate for the recipient of the Victoria Cross. Another oddity still is Johnston's knowledge of Swedish, if he came as claimed from Hanover. It has therefore been suggested that Johnston's real name was Johan Johansson and that he was Swedish, but that this name was anglicised 
by the ship's clerk to John Johnston when he signed up. He may also have had a given name of Wilhelm, which was anglicised to William, although this is not recorded on the ship's muster list. If he was Swedish, his reasons for signing up and claiming that he was from Hanover are unknown. If being known as William rather than John was also a part of his deceptive signing up, and if he was indeed running away from something, we do not know. He could have been John Johnston, known as William, and therefore became universally known as William throughout the ship, so that when Captain Hastings, Yelverton of HMS Arrogant, wrote his dispatch to Admiral Napier, Yelverton named him William. That dispatch was included by then Vice Admiral Napier in a letter recommending both men for the Victoria Cross on January 31st, 1856. And we will continue this fascinating tale in a couple of weeks' time. Once again, do please join up to become a patron at patreon.com forward slash the history network. We thank all our patrons who make this podcast possible. Thanks again for listening. You've been listening to the history network dot org podcast written by Murray Darm, read by Nick Barker. 